Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Today, why money is an abundant resource, how to get your PhD in doing. Then we're getting professorial on you as a formal PhD joins us to talk about the danger in asset bubbles and the latest real estate technology on Get Rich Education. Most runner property investors choose either positive cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market can provide both Jacksonville, Florida, with 9% lower home prices than the national median, 1% higher gross rents, and Jacksonville has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets since 1991. Get positive cash flow today and appreciation for tomorrow. To invest for cash flow and growth in Jacksonville, go to cashflowandgrowth.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Irving, Texas to Irvine, California and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. Money is an abundant resource. In fact, you've got to believe that money is an abundant resource while living amongst a society where so many people think that money is scarce. Look, there are trillions of dollars constantly flowing through the economy and trillions of euros and pesos and yen too. So all you need to do is build your money diverter. Divert some of that flow that's circulating. And wouldn't it be awesome if you could build a durable diverter and even use a template that someone else has already written for you with something like real estate that's generationally proven to build wealth in order to create that diverter that's what you need to do. Look, think about it this way. You can only have one job, maybe two, but you can own as many fourplexes as you want. And you can own as many rental single family homes as you want. And you can own as many apartment buildings as you want. And as many vending machines as you want. And you can own as many assisted living homes as you want. Because that income is residual. It doesn't make you show up in order to participate in that income stream. Now, when you get a traditional formal education, well, that's still largely geared toward job training, more so than entrepreneurship or critical thinking. Now, maybe you wonder why you've never heard about anything other than really this job training type of stuff that you get in school. You're wondering, well, now when and where would I ever hear about anything else? Well, I've got the answer. That is right here, right now on Get Rich Education. That's what we do every week. Though you can only have one job, maybe two, yes, you can own as many residential rental units as you want. And when you buy it right, this real estate has the best risk adjusted return of any other investment out there. Part of the reason that the risk is low is that you are paid up to five ways at the same time. Now, look, I constantly still run into people, even experienced real estate investors, that often tell me that they hate debt. Look, if you believe that money is an abundant resource, then you're more likely to be accepting of debt. Because if you think that money is scarce, then you might be afraid to be a debtor of that scarce resource. If a resource is scarce, you wouldn't want to owe others a chunk of it. As soon as I run into debt-free advocates, well, you know what? They don't even need to tell me that their real estate portfolio is small because I already know that. Not only is debt good when it's outsourced to tenants, but interest rates are low as well. Even with low interest rates, a lot of people revert to that basic primordial homo sapien notion of survival and scarcity, and fear. And what they demonstrate is they never got a financial education. When you own more property sooner, like you can with prudently used leverage, what you do sooner is you get your doctorate in doing. 
What about earning your PhD in doing? Your PhD in doing is not some fancy piece of paper with a filigree border. It comes from Cash Flow University, and it might even be the school of hard knocks for your undergrad then, okay? Because real estate isn't always easy, just like anything worth having isn't always easy. It's having street knowledge rather than just seat knowledge. That's another way to think of it. So get control of assets. And once you do, that's when options open up for you. Cash out refinances basically mean that you get an infinite return once you've removed all of your invested dollars. Well, that happens when you've got more debt and more leverage. Money is an abundant resource. And with you right now seeing the lowest interest rates you've ever seen in your entire life, well, then right now, more than ever, the person with good debt wins. And look, if you really believe that money is an abundant resource and you've got debt that's anchored with durable cash flow, it can allow you to basically say something that those in the traditional consumer credit world just wouldn't even believe. And that is this. It's easier to borrow money than it is to earn it. That's blasphemous to some people. See, if you think that money is scarce, then you're afraid to borrow. Now, just because money is abundant, that doesn't mean that you can be careless and wasteful with it. Because look, the air that you're breathing right now is an abundant resource as well. But you'd die if you didn't have just a few minutes supply of it. So when you're careful and you buy right, you can optimize your leverage and you can get that PhD in doing that much sooner. That's the mindset. Now, getting professorial on you here, this week's guest has both a PhD in doing and a formal PhD. We are going to discuss the asset bubble that we're in right now and financial technology and more. And after our chat, I'll come back and discuss some real estate technology with you. This week's guest lives in New York City, and he's an associate professor at NJIT. That's the New Jersey Institute of Technology at the Martin Tuckman School of Management, which is in Newark. Prior to that, he had an international Wall Street career. He started a tech company that he sold as well. His bachelor's is from Yale. His doctorate is from Princeton. So he has this formal education, and he has real-world experience, and he's also in academia today. He also founded the New Jersey Innovation and Acceleration Center, where they were awarded a grant. And this is interesting. He also directs the Lear Center for what's called financial bubble research. And yet somehow amongst all that, he found time to be on the show for you today. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Dr. Michael Ehrlich. Wow, that was quite an intro. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're like, how am I going to possibly live up to that? But watch, you will. Michael, I'd like to talk about financial technology and how that next tech breakthrough is going to impact both everyday consumers and real estate investors later on in the show here. But first, your research specializes in market failures and bubbles, and it shows that we are in a bubble now. So what indicators tell you that we're in a bubble? Tell us about that. We've done a lot of work to sort of identify things that happen in bubbles and things that happen when you're near bubbles. And so we see a relaxing of covenants in terms of loans, so it's easier to get loans. We see uh, more hyped up advertising for some segments of the economy. We've seen certainly a lot of hype about the tech sector, the big five companies. We look at things like uh, credit spreads. And so we've seen a dramatic narrowing of credit spreads over the last couple of years that have just now begun to widen out a little bit, but still are remarkably tight by historical standards. We're talking about the big five companies. I'm pretty sure you're talking about Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. When we talk about credit spreads. What do you mean there? What is uh, it about credit spreads that helps create or sustain a bubble? Debt and leverage are very important parts of the economy. And debt is not fundamentally a bad thing, but too much debt can be a problem. Over leveraging can be a problem. But the thing that regulates debt is the credit spread. And so core credit, base credit, we think of as the treasury market. That's kind of the risk-free rate. There's no chance of default by the federal government or virtually no chance of default by the federal right. government. But banks charge a premium on that based on sort of how risky they perceive you to be. 
So if you're in the world of credit ratings, if your government is AAA, if you're a triple B credit, which is still a pretty good company, a credit worthy company, uh, you might be paying uh, historically a percent or a percent and a half more than the treasury rate. And so that would be the credit spread. And recently that's gone below a percent. And so those spreads are very tight by historical standards. More remarkable is that if you used to make investments in emerging market debt, you used to make investments in Argentine or Brazilian debt or Nigerian debt that might be at a spread of 15 or 20 percent above the U.S. Treasury rate. And those rates have come down hugely down to four, five, six percent, even three percent for some of those countries. So what that means is people are not concerned about the risk of those credits of, of high yield countries or high yield businesses. And when people perceive low risk, it's kind of a sign that there's a bubble because if they're perceiving low risk there, then they're making more aggressive investments and they're taking more chances with their investments in general. So with a smaller credit spread, we're talking about less profitability for lenders as well. We're talking about less profitability for lenders. But the flip side of that is if you have a chance right now to lock in a long-term mortgage to buy real real property, it's a steal because you could get a 30-year mortgage today for rates close to 3%, which is just unbelievable. So you're borrowing money at a 3% rate is pretty close to zero for long-term. And so those types of, so for borrowers, this is a great time. And yeah. you're seeing, by the way, not just real estate, but also like private equity, a lot of private equity deals get driven by the fact that they can borrow cheaply the money that they're using to buy the companies. Yeah, that's exactly what we do here at Get Rich Education, tie up long-term fixed interest rate debt. But importantly, and you mentioned over-leveraging, we tie that to an asset that's projected to cash flow, where the monthly rent income is expected to exceed all of the monthly expenses. Our definition here of over-leveraging is if you borrow so much money, but you don't have the ability to service the debt because your properties are cash flow negative for some reason, when you can't service the debt, now you're over-leveraged, now you've got a problem. So I agree with that. And so over leverage really has to do with how much debt versus how much risk. The thing that makes me nervous sometimes is when people borrow, just for argument's sake, 95% of the money for real estate, and then they discover that there's kind of a, a disruption, say a pandemic, for example, where suddenly people aren't paying their rent. So you need to have enough kind of cushion that you can bear the uncertainty uh, that does happen from time to time. Sure. And part of that's being diversified in multiple markets. That's something that's lost on so many real estate investors. They invest only in one market, particularly their home market. Tell us about how long you think this bubble will last and more about the nature of the bubble. Is it more of an asset bubble, more of a debt bubble? This one is probably not a traditional asset <laughs> bubble in the way that we've seen them in the past. The most recent asset bubble that we think of was the 2000 sort of eight, nine experience. And that was primarily in real estate and subprime mortgages and whatnot. But this bubble probably is debt related. And of course, it's fueled by a very liberal Federal Reserve. Yeah. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been aggressive about putting money out there. The supply of money is very large. That means the cost of money is very low. The cost of money we measure is interest rates. So interest rates are very low. That can't last forever. That has to change eventually. Eventually, rates are going to go up. Now, you asked about when. If I had the real crystal ball on when, I probably wouldn't be talking on the show. I'd be just <laughs> doing it. The when is very difficult. But certainly, one can project that out five, 10 years, rates are going to be significantly higher. It's just hard to see how they're not going to be higher than where they are right now. Again, if you're getting like a 30-year mortgage, then you basically locked in the good rates now for a time when rates are going to be much higher. And so this is a good time to be locking in your long-term debt. 100%. One thing I say about bubbles, Michael, something people forget about is you actually do want to be invested in a bubble. That is good for you. That probably means that you've enjoyed some asset appreciation and some asset inflation, but you just don't want to be around when the bubble bursts. That's when you get hurt. And like you said, the timing on that is virtually impossible to predict. The most interesting fact about bubble, actually, is that bubbles are not really crazy. Bubbles are when people look and find a good opportunity, they invest in it, and then kind of get carried away. And people who don't know why they're investing start to invest, and you kind of get this euphoria, and then you kind of get to this uh, place where the emperor has no clothes and, and the bubble pops. But long run, bubbles almost all pay off. 
even the most weird historical bubbles. I mean, so the weirdest historical bubble is probably the famous tulip mania of uh, what, 1636, 37. In the Netherlands. Right? So this is in the Netherlands. This is almost 400 years ago. And at that time, there was this new innovation that came from Turkey, tulips. And these tulips were beautiful flowers, and you could see them in the paintings of that time. All the still life showed pictures of tulips because it was really a valuable, special thing. And what made it super special was that they would get a virus, and they would have a pattern in the tulips that was really unique. And you could only get re reproduce those tulips by having a bulb and having it reproduce the bulb underground over a winter season. Over the winter of 1636-37, people valued these rare and exclusive bulbs super highly. And the prices got to be crazy prices, and eventually it, it popped and burst and, and did what it did. And then there was a bailout by the government as well, and all the things that you think in bubbles actually happened back then too. But here's the interesting fact. If you look at the world cut flower market today, worldwide, now it's a multi-billion dollar per year market, but that market is to this day dominated by the Dutch. They grow them in other places. They grow them in Curacao and flowers all over the world. But the trade in the, of those flowers is dominated by the Dutch. And the reason it's dominated by the Dutch today, 400 years later, is that 400 years ago, the Dutch kind of overinvested in tulips and really got really good at growing flowers and cultivating flowers. And that expertise persists to be a multi-billion dollar business today. And you can see that in many, many examples where there was a bubble in the railroads and people overinvested in the railroads, but ultimately they became super valuable. Recently, people overinvested in fiber optic cable, and there was a bubble in fiber optic cable. But again, that has paid off to where we now are able to get cheap and easy Netflix and all sorts of other things that we wouldn't have had if we didn't have that bubble. So usually, these bubbles, which come from good innovations, pay off long run, but it can take a while. And of course, in the meanwhile, people there's usually winners and losers. And so some people end up losing everything in those bubbles, as WorldCom did in the fiber optic uh, cable business but then others pick up that cable at pennies on the dollar and, and turn it into gold. That's interesting. A lot of people don't think about the long-term bubble winners. We just think about the short-term bubble losers, like that person that paid the top price, the $800 for the Dutch tulip hundreds of years ago, right before everyone said, what are we doing paying hundreds of dollars for one tulip before that entire market fell apart? There was an intrinsic value behind that tulip. Of course, there is intrinsic value behind something like real estate. People need a place to live. But interestingly, in the last downturn 12 years ago, we learned that there wasn't any durability of the loan. The person that had the loan on that real estate didn't have the income to keep servicing that debt. Of course, today, lending has been more responsible leading up to this recession. And there are other things going on in the housing market, like the low interest rates and the low inventory where housing demand exceeds supply. We were in the opposite condition 12 years ago. Interestingly, Michael, when it comes to a debt bubble, I kind of think we're at the point where nearly everyone is in substantial debt from consumers that have credit card and student loan debt to investors that have a bunch of mortgages to the local municipality or the county that you live in to our own federal government's $27 trillion in debt. So everyone, therefore, should have a vested interest in interest rates wanting to stay low. But with all this dollar printing, if inflation does kick in down the road, well, then the tool that the Federal Reserve commonly uses to tamp down on inflation is higher interest rates. For those that don't understand that, you know, if rates are 3% now and they go up to 15%, I'd like to ask you, the listener, how willing would you, the listener, be to borrow or buy real estate or start your own business if interest rates go up that much? So that's why higher interest rates slow an economy. It slows that velocity of money. And as we mentioned, as real estate investors, we have relative immunity from harm with these 30-year fixed rate mortgages. But Michael, I'd like to ask you, with these high debt levels that almost everyone has, can we raise rates? How would that look? Is that what would be the pin that pricks the bubble and makes it burst? At some point, so we all rely upon this thing we call money, and we think money is a good thing. But really, there's kind of a collective illusion that goes on that money is something of value. I mean, really, it's just a weird looking scrap of paper that's kind of printed in this kind of a funny way. <laughs> and money itself has no real intrinsic value. It's valuable because we all believe it's valuable. And the problem is, at some point when there's so much money floating around the economy, people are going to lose faith that it has value. And of course, you see that in hyperinflations 
which we've seen in Argentina and other parts of the world where people abused their currency. The U.S., I'm not going to say we're abusing our currency, but we're getting to a place where at some point, some people are going to start to lose confidence in the currency. We see that a little bit actually in the valuation of gold, where, which is kind of people think of as kind of an alternative, or even the valuation of something like Bitcoin which is another kind of strange constructed currency, but people are giving it more value uh, partly in response to the fact that they don't have so much confidence in the U.S. dollar. As that gets to be larger and larger, interest rates have to go up in order to compensate people for holding this thing that they no longer have so much confidence in. So it's not a matter of whether people want interest rates to go up. They're going to go up just because eventually there's going to be so much money floating around that people are going to lose confidence in it. That's right. And people that invest in things like gold and Bitcoin, what those investors are basically saying is we're investing outside of any sort of government system. One worries a little bit about online manipulation from some of the online cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin included. There's a whole lot of Bitcoin that's kind of mysteriously missing or, you know, we don't know where it is. And of course, gold, you know, they keep finding more of it. They're not perfect, but they certainly are uncorrelated with kind of government actions, as you point out. And the governments, not just the United States, but worldwide, have actually been driving interest rates lower in order to facilitate their economies. And again, there's a limit to the effectiveness of that strategy. Are there any other strategies where one can position themselves to help avoid being burnt in an asset bubble or a debt bubble? The core idea, and I think it's really your core idea, Keith, is that you want to buy real assets. And you've talked about real estate, property that has value. Other types of property that are very exciting, I think are interesting, are water. People can basically buy freshwater lakes or stores of freshwater. People can buy also places where we grow food, agricultural land, farms. Those are great real assets because people are going to need water. People are going to need food. People need, as you said earlier, a place to live. And so those kinds of real assets, even if there's a downturn in the economy, ultimately people need those things. Now, interestingly, in the modern economy, we're now seeing real assets being things like connectivity, Wi-Fi, fiber optic connections. Those are good real assets as well. And to some extent, some of those real assets you're able to invest in as well, both directly and through companies that have a control of those real assets. That's a good way to think about it. One can think of community as an asset in the community that something like connectivity brings. Certainly, we're a real estate investing show and you live in New York City. A lot of times on this show, I've talked about the de-densification trend, really New York City being that most densely populated place in the United States is somewhat of a proxy for what's going on in the pandemic and the de-densification trend. So since you live there, can you just tell us what you're seeing boots on the ground anecdotally? And first of all, what neighborhood or area do you live in? So I live uh, downtown in an area known as Tribeca, which doesn't really mean anything. It's on the west side, downtown, just north of the World Trade Center, if you've ever been here. I've stayed at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Tribeca before. Oh, very nice. Okay, there you go, right in the nave. But what I would say is that what we're observing is a tremendously overbuilt market for high-end real estate. Because New York, there's been a huge boom in building. One of the sayings that I gave, made up for my wife is that... Uh, 80-story buildings of the new 60, talking about stories and buildings, not age. So we're seeing taller buildings, bigger buildings, heavily residential buildings, and they're overbuilt. The buildings that have been built over the last 10 years, the apartments that have been built over the last 10 years, probably are less than 50% sold. So there's an overhang. And if there's a downturn in the market, as there is kind of with the pandemic, that is going to lead to some pain for some people who invested in some of those properties. Because in fact, New York City, unlike some parts of the country, is not good cash flow country. It's very hard to kind of be cash flow positive in real estate investments because it's gone up by so much historically. That may well turn around, bringing prices down very dramatically. The other thing that we're seeing is that corporations are discovering they don't really need, they sent their people home and they're discovering they really need all that office space they had. People work from home pretty effectively and they can save all that money on real estate. So big tenants, you know, JP Morgan Chase or other large companies are discovering that maybe they can let some real estate go and they can have people share offices. Finally, you're looking at commercial space. Again, we've built a lot of new commercial space, a lot of new kind of malls and retail opportunities. The problem is people aren't going out to the stores, partly due to the pandemic, but partly also due to this cyclical trend where basically people are moving towards de-densification, as you said, and buying things online. All of those trends are combining to put pressure on New York City real estate prices 
there's likely to be some ugliness in New York City real estate, which, of course, for a smart investor could be an opportunity, but it could last for a while, which is your de-densification trend. Having said that, weirdly, people really like to live close to each other. And I can imagine a time, three years, five years in the future, when the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, we're not thinking about it anymore, it's all past. And at that point, people like living closer to each other. And businesses have found historically that people are more productive when they have informal interchanges, which they can have in person, not so much by Zoom. Right. That's a good point. Some people just feel energized when they're around other people. But yeah, when some New York City real estate segments were overbuilt before the pandemic, then the pandemic hit, that sure is going to cause some pain in some real estate markets like the luxury end and like commercial. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Dr. Michael Ehrlich. More when we come back is Dr. Ehrlich and I are going to tell you about that next technology that will disrupt your financial life as both an everyday consumer and as a real estate investor. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans, and they finance single-family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Fortunately for you, Congress has made it possible to get up to $200,000 out of your current 401k or TSP to invest in real estate or your own business, and that's even if you're still working. The thing is, you can get all this money tax-free. The EQRP is your secret weapon. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the EQRP company helps you unleash your retirement funds now. Learn more and text message QRP in all capital letters to 72000. This is Richard Duncan, publisher of Macro Watch. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. He's the PhD, and I'm not. He's Dr. Michael Ehrlich from the New Jersey Institute of Technology's Martin Tuckman School of Management. They are the largest technology-based incubator in the region, and they're basically at the intersection of where business meets technology. So let's talk about disruptive technologies and implications for the fintech industry. For those that don't know, fintech broadly means to me, maybe Michael will want to temper this, it's financial technology. That's tech that automates and improves your use of banking and financial services. For example, 15 years ago, you deposited a paper check that was written out to you with a bank teller in person a lot of times. Maybe you deposited into an ATM. And today, if you even get a paper check, you would use your phone to take a photo of both sides of it from home and then you deposit it in about one minute that way. So that's what I think of as fintech, Michael. What are your thoughts? That's exactly right. So broadly, I spend a lot of time looking at financial markets and institutions. And financial markets and institutions are these very complicated systems of banks and all this transfers and insurance companies and all sorts of institutions that are in the business basically of solving really a simple problem. How do I get the money from the people that have it to the people that need it. And how do I monitor that money to make sure it's being done, being handled fairly and properly? So we've created all these specialized institutions where you deposit money in the bank or you get a public offering for your stock through an investment bank, or you go to an insurance company to guarantee you against some risks or a whole bunch of other types of transactions. Now, the problem is we've relied upon traditionally these large brick and mortar institutions that are frankly pretty expensive. And so FinTech is all about trying to disintermediate. That is get in the middle of those financial institutions and cut out the middleman and trying to reduce costs and improve efficiency. So we're seeing lots of versions of FinTech. One version is known as peer-to-peer -peer lending. So instead of my putting my money on deposit in the bank and the bank then lending it out to somebody else, I can over online, I can find that person directly myself and I can lend the money to them directly. So instead of earning 1% or less on my money in the bank and having the person who borrowed the money pay 5%, I can just lend it to them at 3%. I'm doing 2% better and they're doing 2% better. And so we're both better off by having kind of cut out the middleman. 
Now you're seeing that in lots and lots of ways. So we used to have these investment advisors. Now we have online advisors, robo advisors, we call them. And we also have algorithmic trading. You can basically set up how you want to do your trading and have the computer do it for you without having to do it yourself. And that saves both time and money as well. In the sector we're talking about, two really hot areas are real estate tech and insurance tech. So it used to be if you wanted insurance, you'd have to go to an insurance agent. They'd shop for you to find the best insurance rates. Now you can see right away what all the different offerings are. You can have a competitive bid for your insurance as a business or as a person for your auto, for your house, for your life. All those are readily available. Real estate tech, you see people are coming up with strategies. So again, to manage buildings better. One little company that I've been looking at has actually come up with a strategy to monitor the usage of electricity much more closely. It used to be there's kind of one monitor for the whole building. Now you can monitor yeah. it every single outlet and you can see who the energy hogs are and who the energy uh, saviors are. And of course, encourage people to do the right behaviors, which actually has a tremendous positive effect on saving electricity, on saving water usage, tons of other resources we're able to use much more efficiently by clever use of technology to monitor them, track them, encourage people to and give people the incentives to have the right behaviors, not waste uh, their energy and water and other resources. So those are things that we're seeing more and more. We're going to continue to see them more and more. And what they do is they make even old buildings much more efficient. From a real estate investment perspective, you can get an old inefficient building and fairly cheaply upgrade the systems so that suddenly it operates as a much more modern, efficient building. And you can, of course, that, that goes right to your bottom line if you're a building operator. So how would that work for a real estate investor? How does that technology interface when someone, an owner of, say, an apartment building wants to monitor the natural gas use or monitor the electricity use of individual units? So again, it used to be that you would have to put in a very expensive sub-monitoring system. You'd have to have a separate gas line going to each apartment to be able to track the gas. Now they can have little monitors that are right in your local uptake for the main gas main. And basically they can measure your usage of gas. And they could then bill you for it. Or if you're using excess, they can basically uh, you know, charge you or penalize you in some fashion. And of course, what that does is People generally want to do the right thing. People generally don't want to waste water, but maybe they don't know they're wasting water. People don't want to waste gas, but they don't know they're wasting gas. And if you let them know, they can then behave in the right ways and, and ways that are environmentally sustainable for all of us and basically also reduce costs. And from a building owner's perspective, if I can basically get my four tenants or 400 tenants, if I can get them to operate more efficiently, that just saves me money that flows right to my bottom line. That's right. If the tenant knows that a referee is on the court, the tenant is less likely to commit fouls. What else should someone know about fintech, whether that's forward facing for the consumer, something that could very well change their everyday life and change their habits like depositing that check with their smartphone in the near future, or whether that's something that's more geared toward real estate investors? One thing you should know is that companies that have been in business for a very long time may be under tremendous financial pressure even quite soon. The banking sector is a highly regulated sector, but they have actually uh, lost a lot of what used to be profitable business for them, especially the smaller regional banks. It used to be they had an advantage because they were experts in their local ecosystem. But now with credit rating systems and ability for people to monitor from afar, you mentioned earlier about people buying real estate you know, far from home as being a good strategy in diversifying. Actually, that makes sense for financial institutions as well. So a lot of the little financial institutions, particularly some of the, for instance, uh, uh, savings and loans or credit unions are under tremendous pressures. They're trying to figure out what do they do to continue to make money as fintech basically kind of cuts them out and as the big banks kind of gobble up the diversification plays. So I would say as an investor, Fintech is a great space to be investing in, but it's also going to be treacherous for some old line business. A lot of businesses are going to find that they're now in the buggy whip business and there's nobody selling any buggies. Well, a lot of real estate investors are interested in, can I close a property faster than 30 to 60 days? 
after the purchase offer is accepted, whether that's an inspection where you still need to have a human being come on out and take a look at things like, are there GFC outlets in the kitchen? Or is there a railing on that tall porch outside? And time taken up with the appraisal, usually it's still done by a human being that comes inside the unit. Or title companies and closing, is there anything there with that purchase process where you see FinTech closing the gaps and collapsing timeframes? Oh my, yes. So one of the companies that I'm working with, not to be named, but is working on looking at mortgage documents and basically looking at mortgage and mortgage insurance and all those documents that people collect, which is a very manual process right now. As you point out, very expensive. They charge really big fees for closings. And they charge those big fees because a lot of people touch it and get involved and look at it and think about it. Right. They've gotten it to the place now where they can actually process mortgages with about 50% of them needing no personal involvement. They can verify and validate income. They can verify and validate appraisals. Uh, they can do a tremendous amount of processing work without any human intervention at all. And that number keeps going up. We're looking at a place where a time when we can reduce the cost right now, even for wholesale mortgages, they're saving hundreds of dollars per mortgage right now for existing mortgage processors and mortgage companies. That's only going to go up. And of course, that ultimately, that falls to the bottom line for them in the short run. But in the long run, that saves money for consumers because, it, again, makes those loans faster, easier, quicker. We're already seeing more of that, but that is a trend that is continuing and accelerating at a very fast pace. That is very good to hear because I commonly buy rental property that's located more than a thousand miles from me, property that I've never even seen. And I still have a mobile notary come into my home with a stack of papers and I sign that with a pen. Now, the pandemic might make that a bit more electronic and help some of that time frame collapse in that way. But all of these efficiencies, what it would really do is increase liquidity of what I consider to be a low liquidity asset like real estate. And would that be a good thing or bad thing? I don't know. I've talked before about how liquidity in real estate, in the fact that it's low, that's a bad thing because it can be difficult to get out. It's also a good thing because there's no panic selling in real estate. And when there's no panic selling, that helps stabilize prices. So low liquidity actually leads to high stability in the asset class. Well, I have good news and bad news for you, Keith, because one of the startups that I've been looking at just recently is focusing actually on fractional ownership. So they're looking at these large buildings that you normal people like us wouldn't have any access to. And what they're looking at is a tradable asset where you own a one one hundredth or one one thousandth or one ten thousandth of a very large office building. And you could put together a diversified portfolio yourself and you could buy and sell them and trade them much more liquidly than we can currently do for large buildings. That, I think, is, as you point out, a double-edged sword because, of course, it allows greater liquidity, but it also means that more investors who are unsophisticated can get in the market, and it gives more potential for those investors so those investors who are unsophisticated to be get panicked and to have to sell. So that could actually affect what people perceive and make the real estate market appear to be much more volatile than it appears to be right now. Sure. And that fund type of investor could have less control as well. Well, Michael, you brought up a lot of interesting things here, serving as that professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. If someone wants to learn more about you or what you do at NJIT or what's done there at the Martin Tuckman School of Management, how can they do that? Our web portal is pretty informative, njit.edu. Come on and visit. At the Martin Tuckman School of Management, we have really two pillars of excellence. One is this area of innovation, entrepreneurship, commercialization of technology. The other one is business data science, business analytics. And those are really great areas for us. They lead, we have a degree in FinTech. We have uh, great programs in marketing analytics. So if you're interested in further education for yourself or for your children, or you just want to like get involved in some of our seminar series, come on by njit.edu, Martin Tuckman School of Management. We're there for you and we'd love to follow up and chat some more. If there's a young student that said, hey, I want to do that thing in a couple years, what is that thing that NJIT can help that student that wants to do that thing in a couple years? What is that thing? One of the big ones is data science, data analytics. We have a PhD program in business data science, but when I was a young fellow, basically you'd get a maybe 20 data points, you'd plot them on a piece of paper, you'd get a ruler, you'd try to draw a line through it and say what the trend is. Now the data comes at you like it's a fire hose. And the problem is not the data, but you have to figure out what's the signal and what's the noise. 
And so we really help people learn how to get the signal out of the data so they can learn things that are actionable decisions about you know, trends and what's going on and segmenting the marketplace. That's really a hot area. Other one that, that we focus on is this area of commercialization of technology because there's a lot of good ideas out there. This, we talked about fintech. These all lead to startups. How do I create a startup? How do I make a profitable startup? How do I build a business? And those are areas that we really specialize in as well. They're based in Newark, New Jersey. They are the largest technology-based incubator in the region. That's njit.edu. Dr. Michael Ehrlich, it's been enlightening. Thanks so much for coming out of the show. Keith, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, great material from Dr. Michael Ehrlich today. His name is spelled E-H-R-L-I-C-H. You'll remember that at times I've discussed 3D printed homes and autonomous cars here on the show and how that can change the future of real estate. 3D printed homes are not ready for prime time. Most think of setting up a scaffold outside the structure and then printing what you want inside of it. And the alternative is basically a big 3D printing arm that would instead reach out and then that would need a counterweight. See, with a 3D printed home, you still have a substantial cost for material. There's still some labor cost. And plus, the one thing that doesn't change is the cost of the land beneath the 3D printed home. Autonomous cars can have a pretty profound impact on real estate. In fact, you might remember that I devoted an entire episode to that topic of autonomous cars way back in Get Rich Education episode 13. Basically, you wouldn't own a car. You would instead have a subscription to a car service. They'd pick you up from home or any other location. And because these cars are constantly driving around, fewer parking spaces are needed. That makes the real estate of parking lots and parking garages less desirable. That would also mean that urban streets can become more narrow. It makes urban real estate less desirable overall. And then if you don't own a car or your tenant in a rental single family home does not own a car, well, then that means that the garage is no longer needed. So then garages could get converted into another bedroom and the work from home trend has made extra bedrooms more desirable. So when fewer people own cars and you have just say a really small two bed, one bath, 800 square foot property, and then you convert the garage to a master with an ensuite bedroom. Now you have a 3-2 with, say, 1,100 square feet. Basically, autonomous cars adoption, that has been stunted due to some accidents and some unfortunate loss of life in tests. I-buying, that stands for instant buying. Selling your home to an iBuyer, that might only take a few days. And what this is, it's where companies make these really prompt, algorithm-driven offers pay you all cash for a home, and then they turn around and sell the homes themselves, often sprucing it up in the process. Open Door is the name of a well-known iBuyer. Now, drone photography has been pretty commonplace in real estate for, oh, maybe 10 years or more now. Drones can also help with the neighborhood feel by doing a flyover of an entire area. But there's more here. See, in the future, drones might be able to even give you a tour inside of a property remotely. Wouldn't that be cool if you controlled the drone and gave yourself a tour of the inside of a home a thousand miles away that way? Although right now it is still pretty difficult to navigate a drone through a small enclosed space like a home that could change over time. Traditional staging of a property that can be a pretty big expense. VR and AR have inroads here. Virtual tours can also have virtual staging. Rumi is the name of a platform that lets realtors virtually create staging by digitally adding in furniture and accessories to some interior photos. And like Michael and I discussed today, closing on a property deal that has a lot of room for speeding up in the process there, more buyers are signing their documents remotely. One hang up has been with notaries, getting that notarization on documents but remote online notarization, sometimes you'll see that RON abbreviated out there. That's a newer trend. It's not currently permitted everywhere, like it's not permitted in New York, but that doesn't mean that a borrower can't still sign their documents remotely. And about half of US states don't currently allow for RON, but due to the pandemic and stay-at-home orders, a lot have issued emergency orders to help RON move forward. 
When it comes to cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is the most popular one. And did you know that I own Bitcoin? Yes, I sure do. A real estate guy like me owns Bitcoin. Well, why did I buy Bitcoin in the first place? And with what's been happening lately, why do I consider selling my Bitcoin? Well, I'll talk about that in a future show here. Next week, expect the guy that actually makes taxes fun more than anyone else in the world. Tom Wilwright and I are going to be on the show together. We're going to discuss how the election of either Donald John Trump or Joe Biden and their tax plans and other policies would affect real estate investors and consumers like you. Do you want your PhD from a financial institution or would you rather have your PhD in doing? Well, I think that today's brilliant guest, Dr. Michael Ehrlich, has done both. Learn more about him and the Martin Tuckman School of Management, where they focus on innovation, entrepreneurship, and even a degree in fintech at njit.edu. For Dr. Michael Ehrlich and the entire team here at GRE, most of whom have been here for all six years, Andrea Newburn, Vidran Jampo, Nikon Roy, and Mickey Salagano, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.